And now, you know, the conversation around Dak Prescott centers around $60 million per year. And there's so many people that for some reason still don't understand the way this works. And they say, well, he shouldn't make as much as Mahomes or as much as Burrow or as much as whatever. And it's just, I mean, you mentioned yesterday's price is not today's price. You have to pay the like laws of supply and demand. And the Cowboys seem to believe that they are the exception here. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Mob ENT podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. We got a special guest on with us tonight, RJ Ochoa. For those who do not, do not know who he is, manager and editor of the blogging The Boys. 2016 Rock the Mic champion. Everything you need to know about the Cowboys and pretty much NFL in general, this is the man that you should go to. RJ Ochoa, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for a shout out to 2016. That was a long time ago, uh, but it feels like yesterday in a lot of ways, but happy to be here. Hey, we appreciate you hopping on with us. So I want to get into the, before we even talk Cowboys and football, what inspired you to get into sports journalism? What motivated you to be a sports journalist for you? Um, I mean, that's a really complicated question. And I mean, I, I don't have, you know, 20 years to kind of outline it. But um, I suppose the shortest version is I always knew that I loved the Cowboys, obviously, and, and was a fan of the team, a diehard fan. I mean, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's it's back to school season right now. And I remember very vividly when I was a junior in high school, um, I went back to school shopping with my dad. And, you know, you at that age, you get like, you know, like a pair of shoes, you know what I mean? And that's like, your, those are your shoes for like the year or whatever. And um, this was the fall of 2000 or entering the fall of 2006. And T.O. had signed with the Cowboys that that off season. And so we were at, um, you mentioned you're in New Jersey. We were at a, a, a store that's really popular in the Southeast called Academy. It's like, it's like sporting goods, but it's, it, they have apparel and equipment and things like that. And um, so they had some T.O. jerseys. And my dad asked me, you know, hey, do you want to do you want this? My dad's been a Cowboys fan his whole life. Obviously, you know, we're all from Texas and my family. And I said, do you want this jersey? And I had never really had like my own, you know, that's like, like when I was a little kid, you know what I mean? Uh, but my own jersey. And I was like, yeah. And um, I, I vividly remember he was like, well, are you going to wear it? You know, like you know, the way your parents would tell you, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to spend this money, you know, if you're not going to wear it. And I was like, yeah. And so I partly kind of got into it um, because of the jersey, right? Like it, that was kind of what motivated me. And um, and just kind of fell in love. And I don't know how old you are, but that that season was the year that Tony Romo took over uh, midway through the year. And it was just, I mean, captivating for me. Like, I, I mean, I just lived and died with the team. And, you know, I finished high school and went to college and my dad is a, an engineer. So I thought I have to be an engineer. And I quickly kind of fell out of love with that. And um, and and, you know, like a lot of kids and young people didn't know what I wanted to do. And this was around 2012 ish. And I had won at the time this like retweet to enter contest with the Cowboys. Um, I won yeah. an autographed photo of Walt Garrison. And because of that, I got somewhat in touch with their social media coordinator at the time. His name was Shannon Gross. And we, we were just kind of Twitter friends. And one day I was in Dallas and I just shot my shot, said, Hey, do you want to meet up for lunch? And he said, Yeah. And so we met up and um, he just kind of told me about his job. And I thought, it was just the sickest thing in the world, like the way he described it. And so I thought like, I just have to find a way to do this because this is the Cowboys were all I wanted to talk about and think about. And uh, I annoyed people in my life, you know, talking about them and, and you know, with my own thoughts and conspiracy theories, this was in, you know, social media was kind of just becoming popular. So I had nowhere, no outlet to kind of share these things. Um, and so it, it was, it was, it was just kind of this this thing that was born within me and it through all that time and um it was around 2015 when i started to kind of blog about the cowboys i found a blog at the time called inside the star wrote five articles a week we had a podcast aff affiliated with the site that was kind of coming off the ground at the time so i was like hey if you ever need somebody you know, i just kind of wanted to do anything and everything i could and i was living in san antonio at, at that time in my life and you mentioned rock the mic uh there was a local radio station that sports radio station that had kind of an open mic contest and I was extraordinarily blessed to win it. 
and that was 2016. That was Dak and Zeke's rookie year, um, which was just this hot year for the Cowboys. And uh, that year, the Super Bowl happened to be in Houston, which was, you know, driving distance for me. And, uh, you know, had family who lived there. And, you know, the radio station said, hey, you know, we can't pay for you to do anything, but we can get your credential. You want to come be our hands and help us and meet some people, whatever. And so I, I would say yes to things like that. And um, I'm very, very, very fortunate that I had support along the way uh, by way of my now wife and my parents and, and just kind of people believing in me and, and championing my cause. Uh, but it was just things like that, that that all kind of came together for me that helped the dream, honestly, to this day, continue to live. That's dope. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, especially that year with T.O. and Tony Romo, even going back players, you know, that people don't remember, the Marion Barbers of the world when it was Julius Jones. They, right, I right. definitely remember that because I was born into it also. My father was a Cowboys fan. His father was a Cowboys fan. And I believe my grandfather's grandfather was a Cowboys fan. So it's been in generations, Cowboys Nation, for sure. I was going to ask, was it always the goal? to work with the Cowboys, but obviously that definitely was. I mean, so I obviously don't work for the Cowboys, but the, the goal was – the goal, honestly, if I look back, was never really defined. The goal was never like yeah. this specific place, this specific thing. It was just I want this to be my life. And yeah. even still today, I mean, I'm just so thankful to be employed by Fox Media and SB Nation and have the job that I do and um, have the creative freedoms that I do to you know do the things that, that I find interesting and, and that they want to support as well. Um, but the job I have now, you know, this is I, I got this job in 2018 and it isn't the way I thought it was then. It isn't the way I thought it was a year ago. Right. Like things are always changing. And so um, ultimately, the, the fact that, you know, I work from home, I get to get up. Um, I'm recording this with you in my home office and my two little dogs are, are sleeping on the floor here. Um, I, it's just it's I, I would have never been able to have imagined this. And so I'm just really grateful for, you know, things working out along the way to get me to where I am right now. That's dope. Um, I know a lot of people that would love to be able to do that. But to to your point of being able to just work in the sports field, that right there is a dream fulfilled for sure. With the Cowboys, like you said, you don't work for them, but you do cover them and you know a lot about the Cowboys. Check out the blog. Very, very good information. If y'all haven't, it's going to be linked in the bottom. Get into the nitty gritty of it. I don't know if you ever seen, you know, when Fat Joe said yesterday's, yesterday's price is not today's price. Yeah, the Cowboys, I think this is definitely something that resonates with them because they could have got Dak, CD, Micah on contract extensions way before this, and this wouldn't have happened. Do you see a path, though, that they could possibly get all three coming back in a Cowboys jersey? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. If, if you look at things the way they stand today, you know, in August of 2024 – there are the fewest amounts of grains of sand left in the Dak Prescott hourglass because they have no contractual control over him. If if they go through the season, he hits free agency. They can do nothing about it. They can't franchise tag him, whatever. Um, C.D. Lamb, on the other hand, this is the final year of his rookie deal, uh, presuming he plays on this specific contract without an extension. Um, they could franchise tag him next year, and they could franchise tag him in 2026 if they really had to. I mean, obviously, we've seen that song and dance um, many times across the NFL and with the Cowboys specifically. Micah has the largest amount of sand left in his hourglass because he's only entering uh, his fourth season. They still have two years of team control over him relative to his rookie contract, of course, and then they could franchise tag him two years. So you're talking about Micah is technically four years away from the position that Dak Prescott is in right now, uh, presuming he didn't hold out or anything like that. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's a world where they get the DAC deal done before the season starts, maybe even the CD deal done, and then they have a lot of time left to do Micah. Um, they will, if that is the case, pay a lot more, that, to your point, than they would have had they done this earlier. It, this is not, you know, brand new breaking information that they could have done this last year. The first quarterback extension to get done last year in the spring of 2023 was Jalen Hurts. Yeah, he hit $52 million per year. And now, you know, the conversation around Dak Prescott centers around $60 million per year. And there's so many people that for some reason still don't understand the way this works. And they say, well, he shouldn't make as much as Mahomes or as much as Burrow or as much as whatever. And it's just, I mean, you mentioned yesterday's price is not today's price. Go buy a car, go buy a house, go buy a MacBook Pro, go buy a PS5 and, and college football 25, go buy Madden, even though it's broken right like no matter what the case is um you have to pay the like laws of supply and demand and 
the Cowboys seem to believe that they are the exception here, that this has been going on much longer than this offseason. This happened with Zeke Elliott to a degree. He forced that hand, obviously, successfully, I might add, in that he got the extension he wanted. It happened with Zach Martin. In fact, the day you and I are recording is the one-year anniversary of the Cowboys bending uh, the knee to Zach Martin. Uh, This happened with Des Bryant in a different way, uh, but they did push him all the way to the deadline for the franchise tag in 2015, and they did get that long-term deal done. So they are very, very, very very well known for you know turning in their homework at the very last second and they're doing it again and it's going to cost them a lot more money and good for Dak and good for CD and probably good for Micah because they're going to make more money as a result of it all but and and I want that obviously as fans of them but if the goal is to build a football team in the most efficient way possible they are failing that test over and over and over again I don't don't know how about that anywho I have to fix that in the post edit so (laughs) so uh what I was saying was with that being the case, that this is what the Cowboys have done. Front office, this is how they handle contracts for whatever reason. What do you feel around the team in the city? Like, what are the expectations of this team this year, especially being that they've actually had pretty successful regular seasons? It's been double digit wins. It's just the playoffs that trips them up. What are the expectations this year? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's strange because it sounds really bad, and, and it is really bad. I, I mean, um, people say this a lot. And, and, you know, just you take it for what, you know, you think my word is worth. But this is this is the, I, I would say, lowest level of excitement that there is surrounding a Cowboys season. And, in, in, you know, in some time, um, it's still football, right? Like you're still into it. Like no, nobody's going to not watch or anything like that. But um, I do think the, the, the hope that you always have that it's possible feels, you know, that light feels, you know, lower than it does or, or farther away in the tunnel than, than it maybe does usually. I don't think that it helps. Um, that the Rangers won the World Series last year, that the Mavericks made it to the NBA Finals, even though they lost, that the Stars made it to uh, the Western Conference Finals and the Stanley Cup playoffs. I mean, it just, you know, no matter where you look, like, they just keep getting dunked on, like, over and over and over again. And, and some of it's not even their fault. Like, that's just, you know, an unfortunate coincidence for them. Um, now, they did poke the bear this offseason with the all-in thing, which is exhausting to talk about still. But by saying that, I mean, they put, you know, they, they put this target on their backs. They made everybody think that they were going to be doing things. And so they kind of set themselves up to get memed into oblivion. And so I think that that has added to it. I will say that I think that the in my time as a fan of the team and covering them, I can't recall a time in which the national um, kind of perspective on them has been what it is now. Uh, the day you and I are recording, uh, Greeny said on McAfee, and rightfully so, that the Cowboys are cheap, that they won't spend any money. I mean, I can't ever – this this has been the case for over a decade, but nobody ever talked about it. But but I think it has reached a bit of a boiling point because it, it's so intensified, uh, particularly by the contracts for Dak and for CD, and because they're these polarizing players in terms of whatever you want to call it. And But to your point – it, it feels like, you know, our pets' heads are falling off, um, but only one team has won more regular season games than them over the last three years, and it's the Kansas City Chiefs, and it's the regular season. I know nobody hangs a banner for that. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that that's awesome. Uh, but, you know, there is an argument to be made that maybe their three worst days over the last three years just happened on the worst possible days ever you know relative to the playoffs and their three playoff losses have come against two different teams one in the san francisco 49ers who we all agree is this kind of would-be dynasty if not for the chiefs and the packers who have this quarterback who we all believe is now like the future of the nfl so it's kind of easy to say well these guys are really good so maybe they just happen to lose to these really really good teams like that doesn't mean they suck and that they're losers um so it's I think it's difficult. It's difficult to, to kind of break away from emotion or break away from logic. And it's also difficult to measure them equally. Um, so it, it's strange because they are good enough to win, you know, another 11, 12 games. And they haven't done anything like this in the drought that they're in, obviously, since 1995. In fact, they've been to the playoffs and they've won double digit games three years in a row for the first time since those days. Um, and, you know, people still act like the quarterback sucks and the head coach sucks, right? Like, you know, the most important, it, it, they, they they can't all suck and, and be this good consistently. Um, so it's very strange. But similarly, if they don't suck then, then you would imagine that you would want to keep them around for the long haul. But amazingly, the most important people who do the most important things are all the ones who are in the contract years. Like, it is just this hilarious, frustrating you know, reality that they somehow stumbled their way into. It's impossible to justify. That's the thing that's funny when it comes to the Cowboys, which we see on a national media level is just like, 
teams that could have the same result are not viewed the same way at all. Like, no, I mean, 49ers haven't, the 49ers haven't gotten over the hump either, but it's not a discussion of should we get rid of Devo? Should we get rid of the coach? Oh, Brock Purdy, you know, it's conversational Brock Purdy, but it's not the same with like Dak Prescott. It's, it's the, I guess because they're America's team. It's the it's so funny seeing it. Th- there are pros that come with that. Don't get me wrong. And I have a job because of that. But I'll, I'll ask you, and I would obviously love for you to answer honestly. Have you heard once in the last, let's call it six months, that the Lions blew a 17-point lead in the NFC Championship game? Has anybody said that at any point? No. Have you seen any piece? Have you seen one Instagram post that talks about this? No. Can, no. can you imagine if the Cowboys blew a 17-point lead in the and, and not only blew it, but Dan Campbell blew it, you know, going wild, going crazy, right? Like being insanely aggressive on – and I understand that that's who he was and that's how they got there, whatever, we can debate that, blah, blah, blah. But if that had been – and that's the case for so many teams, to your point, that it, it, would, be, it would be crazy, it would be chaos, it would be – Remember in the Super Bowl when Kyle Shanahan didn't know the rules, like, like didn't understand the way that the kickoff worked, and you know that if they chose to play defense for us or whatever the case may be, that happened. That literally happened in the Super Bowl, and yet we sit here, we're like, oh, they can get rid of Brandon Ayuk, whatever, because he has a proven track record, and I completely understand that. But I would also offer, and I'm, I didn't certainly didn't mean to interrupt, and don't mean to get off on a tangent, but I have my issues with Mike McCarthy. And the way the Cowboys lost in the playoffs, to be straight up with you, hands on the you know cards on the table, I called for them to fire him. They didn't, but that and that's fine. But Mike McCarthy last year said, you know what, this offense that's literally been the best offense in the NFL, I think it could be better. I'm going to move on from the offensive coordinator. And he did. And then everybody said, oh, that guy's going to be amazing with Justin Herbert. And he wasn't. And he was really bad. And granted, the Chargers had a bunch of injuries. But you know what else? McCarthy was right. <laughs> they, they were better. <laughs> they, they were actually better. And Dak Prescott had his best career, his career best season. CeeDee Lamb had, had his career best season. And have you seen one person say anything? Sean McVay tells you the starting lineup for the Bears when they played them six years ago, and everybody falls all over themselves. But Mike McCarthy called his shot and was completely right, and nobody wants to give him an ounce of credit. I think that's funny you mentioned that because Mike McCarthy has probably been – what the last two or three years always comes in the conversation of on the hot seat, but nobody mentions like that point right there. Yes. He has some stuff that you might want to, you know, nitpick at that happens in the playoffs. But if you look at any coach, you could say that about any coach. Nobody mentions, like you said, on the national media, I haven't seen the Stephen A's of the world say, you know what? Mike McCarthy did say he was going to take over the offense, and they actually didn't miss a beat. They actually improved. Yeah, it kind of just goes under the radar with, it's, with that. It's, again, part of what comes with all this, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's you know, and I think McCarthy handles that oddly better than Jason Garrett did. Um, you know, he had a line in the, his first press conference after they lost to the Packers that I thought was really great and I thought would, would kind of help through the Cowboys of it all. He was asked, because, I mean, look, this team is fighting a, a shadow that is almost 30 years old at this point, and, and they're constantly measured against it. And it doesn't help that all the legends of the past are either, you know, analysts on the network that are broadcasting their game or the color commentator, you know, on the game itself, right? Like, anywhere they go, they're reminded of the empire that they kind of sit within and that they've contributed nothing to. Uh, but that being said, Mike McCarthy was asked about the shadow, and he said, look, we take no responsibility for this he said we are completely responsible for what we have failed to do in our time here in this building and i respect that because it's not mike mccarthy's fault that jason garrett failed for a decade it's not you know dak prescott's fault that tony romo bobbled the snap in seattle or that he and jason witten went to cabo the week before playing the giants in the divisional round like you know but but we do hold the current team you know responsible for the sins of the past and that is just again as part of what makes them so popular as part of what makes them you know just the discussion point they, they are a very separate team they're notre dame they're man united they're real madrid they're bigger than all of those um and again, I'm personally grateful for it. I just would ask from smart people that they include context in conversations. As an example, I obviously deal with Eagles fans a lot on a daily basis, and I'm grateful for them uh, in a very weird way. But we, we sit here and we act like, oh, and look, let's be clear. Jalen Hurts had a wonderful Super Bowl performance. They could have won that game, and had they done so, it would be remembered as one of the greatest performances of all time. But the two games before that, we again, we act like, well, they got to a Super Bowl. Okay, so they beat... The Daniel Jones Giants, who we all acknowledge suck, right? Like they were really, really, really bad. And then the literal quarterbackless 
San Francisco 49ers. We, we bag on the Cowboys because they beat a below 500 Tom Brady Buccaneers team. It's like, oh, well, you know, the Bucks are below 500. Well, does anybody ever talk about how the Niners literally had Christian McCaffrey playing quarterback? I mean, again, it's just these <laughs> things that, that get used only for this team. It's annoying. It's funny. You just have to kind of accept it for what it is. Yeah, that's, like you said, it's context that has to be added to that. And I think it's a similar aspect of, obviously, the Cowboys is a bigger franchise, definitely more known globally. But it's, a, I think, the equivalent of, like, if you win in New York, they say, hey, if you win in New York, you are goaded forever. If you win in a Cowboys jersey, we've seen what's happened. Even if you don't win in a Cowboys jersey, that's how big the brand is. But if you win in a Cowboys jersey, the Troy Aikmans of the world, Emmitt Smith, the Michael Irvin, if you win a Super Bowl in a Cowboys jersey, that's like three Super Bowl rings, essentially. I mean, if we live in a hypothetical where they get it done in the foreseeable future, uh, I would, and this sounds really, I recognize how stupid this sounds, but Dak, assuming he would be the quarterback in charge, obviously, Dak would be remembered as, as, as a completely different type of Dallas Cowboy. And in that very special way, the greatest Cowboy of all time. Because not only to your point would he have done it for the Cowboys and done it in the 21st century and done it in a social media digital age, but he would have been he would have been Frodo, right? Like he would have taken the ring back to Mordor. Like, no, like everyone think about everyone who failed before him, you know, and not just quarterbacks, not just Romo and, and Drew Bledsoe, but Jason Witten, Des Bryant, DeMarcus Ware, Sean Lee. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. And you're the one, you, I mean, like he would levitate in a way I, I went on. I don't know of another athlete like that. I mean, the only equivalent, and again, I recognize how stupid this sounds, the only equivalent would be LeBron in, in, in the title in Cleveland. That, it would be that big in terms of the, the meaning it would have relative to history and everything that went into that moment. No, that, I think that's a great analogy because Cleveland, yes, that was their first one ever. But the way that the media makes it seem, the pressure that they get every season, that is Super Bowl bust basically every season for them, it's essentially the same thing because most people in this era, the social media era, don't remember or not knowledgeable of the last time the Cowboys actually won a Super Bowl. So to do it in this era and to do it in the same NFL that you have a Patrick Mahomes in, right. it would just weigh completely, completely differently. With Dak Prescott, you mentioned it. So they actually didn't do that much spending in free agency. I think it was something around $30 million or something like that where they didn't spend the most money there was in the bottom of the half of the league of money spent doing free agency you got cd currently he wants a new contract what are they what are the plans what are the expectations on who's going to be the weapon even when cd comes back because i we all expect him to come back at some point who was supposed to be dax weapons we got a a, a zeke re, reunited and it feels so good but i don't know if Zeke is that weapon, Brandon Cooks, Tolbert, Ferguson, what is the expectation? What are they planning on doing uh, for weapons for that? I mean, that's kind of it. <laughs> like, you know, they they cut Michael Gallup um, in the offseason, and he initially signed with the Raiders and then chose to retire. They, you know, have Brandon Cooks in for a second season with them, obviously. They have Jalen Tolbert in his third season, and they brought Zeke back. I mean, that – really is kind of it um they're relying on Dak and Zeke being the guys and again it's ironic because they're the ones that they won't pay <laughs> you know it, it's just and it's it's crazy I mean it, it you would it you would think that like I'm, I'm sure that on some level you thought okay well you know these are my questions for RJ and I'm gonna ask him this because this is kind of confusing to me and he's gonna have an answer he's gonna be able to shed some light on this because it just doesn't make any sense I don't have an answer like this there's, there's nothing more than than that being the plan it really is amazing that this is how we got here. Wow. So, you know, preseason has only been one game. Training camp. Who have you seen in training camp, whether the offense or the defensive side, that so far has exceeded expectations that is looking good so far? I would offer second-round draft pick Marshawn Nealon has been really great, and the Cowboys did lose 
a former second round pick, Sam Williams, he was their second rounder three years ago, uh, to a torn ACL very early in camp. And so that opens the door of opportunity for Marshawn, obviously, to contribute even more as a rookie. And he's looked the part. Um, and, and that's incredibly important in general, but especially if they really do plan on playing Micah a little bit more off ball, uh, which they kind of talked about and it kind of looks like they, they might do. I don't, I don't know that they'll do it a ton, but the fact that they'll do it at all um, is certainly new and different. And, and if you're moving Micah back, you obviously need somebody else to rush the passer, and, and Marshawn Nealon is that guy. So um, that they've hit on him certainly seems to be a, a high point of success, at least so far throughout camp. With Dan Quinn out, Mike Zimmer in, what is the defense supposed to look like this year with him in there, the scheme, you just mentioned they plan on pulling Micah out a little bit. What do you expect? What are fans that should expect with this Cowboys defense? This was the thing that they did over the offseason that I probably had the biggest problem with. Um, I mean, and and I want the Mike Zimmer thing to work out, right? Like, I want to be wrong and all my, you know, hating, and, and I would love for them to be successful, obviously. But um, I think people coped with everything and, and convinced themselves that they liked the Zimmer hire. The other two candidates who they seriously considered were Ron Rivera and Rex Ryan. I mean, you know, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I really have a hard time believing that you're taking this seriously. If, if those are the three people, you know, that, that your brain trust came up with to talk to. Um, you know, and at the time, you know, because whenever you say something like that, people say, well, who do you want? And at the time I said, well, like, you know, I don't know. Let's let's talk to Brandon Staley. I mean, I know things went poorly in L.A., but this this is his thing. Like, you know, maybe, maybe he's just one of those dudes that isn't cut out to be a head coach, whatever, blah, blah. And boom, Kyle Shanahan, you know, scoops him up and says, hey, come on, come work for me. Let's figure this out. And, and maybe that will work out. Maybe it won't. But, uh, but for the record, I mean, it does seem like the Zimmer thing is taking hold. Um, I think on the surface where he's most different from Dan Quinn is Dan is a real buddy, buddy guy with his players. He's real coach, Danny Q, you know, coach pal, coach friend, um, really kind of, you know, the cool uncle. Whereas Mike Zimmer is not, uh, he is very, very disciplined. Um, obviously, you know, older than the players and, and has a little bit of a disconnect, but it does seem like he's going the extra mile to kind of bridge that gap and whatnot. And so it seems like they've met in the middle, which is, is really promising. So uh, the early returns look like I could be wrong on that. Uh, the Cowboys did technically have four interceptions in their first preseason game, although I think a big reason for that was just that Stetson Bennett is who he is. Um, so, I mean, I'm not ready to say I was entirely wrong quite yet, but, but it does look like, you know, the the discipline that, that he's instilling, not just in general, but relative to how they play football is going to be important. They're not focused on just, you know, um, I don't know if you follow Formula One at, at all, but uh, they're not focused on just driving the fastest lap anymore the way they were under Dan Quinn. Like, they understand this is an entire race that they have to have the proper tires for and the proper strategy and, and what if it rains and things like that. So um, I'm anxious to see it, you know, at work in a real-life NFL game. I'm definitely anxious and excited to see what they do this season. I feel with their division, it's really – I mean, you tell me what you think. I think it's really just a two-team race between them and Philly, and Philly has their question marks too. I think the commanders will be improved, and I'm very intrigued and excited to see what J.D. Daniels does. I think it's really between them and Philly, and I, I personally think it's up for grabs between those two teams. And I think if they could figure out the CD and he's there and he's healthy and ready, I can see the Cowboys winning the division this year. So I don't know if you know this, but no NFC East team has repeated as division champion since 2004. Uh, it was the Eagles then. And while that means nothing, um, it also kind of doesn't mean nothing, right? Like, like the 2005 Giants have nothing to do with the 2024 Commanders. But, I mean, it's 20 years worth of history, right? Like, I mean, it's, you know, it's not just like a cute little like three-year streak or something like that. Like, it's, it's, it's long enough that it's interesting. Um, and so, you know, I, it's worth kind of saying out loud at least. And so uh, they are repeating division champions. So history is working against them. I agree with you. I mean, I do think the Eagles are so fortunate. It's it's funny how the Internet has kind of caught on. I'm, I'm a Howie Roseman fan, to be very clear. But it's, it's funny how people have kind of caught on that his draft strategy just seems to be like, oh, who has Daniel Jeremiah mocked all over the place? Like, let me just draft those dudes, and everyone will say that I'm awesome. Um, I don't think that that's actually his strategy, but I don't think that that's not his strategy at the same time. Um, but he makes up for it in other ways, obviously. The draft is not how he's thing. Uh, but that being said, 
I don't. I think that the the just dysfunction around the Cowboys has really bought cover for the Eagles and how their season ended last year. I mean, there was a massive ESPN expose like a week ago about how Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni are still not on the same page. What? <laughs> like this? This is your fourth season together. Like, how are y'all still butting heads? Um, and they had this just incredible collapse, obviously, last year. Um, and Jason Kelsey retired, right? Like, not just this incredible player, but this incredible leader for them. So I could totally see them falling apart, but I could very easily see the Cowboys falling apart as well. In the few years that Washington has won the division um, in the kind of 21st century, since Tony Romo, at least, that's kind of the way I look at the world, um, the three times that has happened have been seasons that featured historic collapses from Dallas. 2020 was Dak Prescott's ankle injury. 2015 was Tony Romo's you know, collarbone injury over and over again. Um, and 2012 was just Dallas kind of choking things away during RG3's magnificent rookie season. So other than that, I mean, they don't really contend. But I do buy Jaden Daniels. I do buy the culture of Dan Quinn. So I, I would not be stunned. Washington might be my dark horse to win it. I, I have a very difficult time seeing Dallas doing it just for all the reasons outlined above. Yeah, all great facts mentioned right there. I'm looking at it the same way you're looking at it in regards of the Eagles got so much going on, and that's a wild thing to even – Reed say that the head coach and the quarterback are still at odds. I don't. That's not a form look for success right there at all. It's so also I can, not normal. Like it's it's not you know it's 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 more than that. It's 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 not like oh they'll figure it out. Like it's been three years. You know what I mean? And I I just find that to be amazing. I could definitely see like you said the dark horse being the Commanders, Dan Quinn, what he's going to be doing over there, and. What's pretty much the same with him, he's a culture builder and things of that nature. So younger team, rebuilding, I wouldn't be shocked, especially being it could be, like you said, similar to that RG3 season with Jay and Daniels just being that dual threat option, passing, running, Eckler over there. They got some weapons, so they, they have something that they could cook with possibly. Before we end off and go to our fourth quarter segment, which is kind of the fun segment, uh, any advice? somebody watching this, somebody listening to this, of anybody trying to get into the field, the career that you are of sports journalism? I mean, I would say um, don't do it the way I did. I mean, like I got really, really, really lucky. Um, And so in that sense, I would say make your own luck, right? Like that's a really, that's a cliche. Um, But talk to people, network with people. Like it's so easy to interact with people not easy, but it's easier. Obviously you can tweet at people, you can find people's email addresses. Like, you know, don't stalk people on the internet, but you know what I'm saying? Like just, you know, make friends on the internet. Um, you know, I've, it, there are so many Cowboys content creators that I've run into that I'm so impressed with that are kids. I mean, 16 year olds who run an Instagram, you know, fan account or whatever, things like that and, and stuff like that. Like, you know, when I, in 2015, when I was like, okay, I have to do this. I had no idea, you know, kind of how to go about it. And I've learned a lot of things along the way. But anybody who has an iPhone now, you have the powers of a television studio in your pocket. Like if you have TikTok, like you can create all sorts of magical, wonderful things. You can create Instagram reels, like try those things out, like and try them out at the very least to try to get reps to, you know, practice to figure it out like you never know when a skill set is going to come into play somewhere down the road and i would also say say yes to everything that you can everything within your range of abilities obviously your range of time and and you know don't overwork yourself but um i mentioned i i started you know doing things for that radio station and i wasn't getting paid anything but i was in a position that i recognize not a lot of people are and i had this incredible privilege in that sense um but i i said yes to everything i could to just open doors you know they asked me a couple of years in if i wanted to go um do stats for high school football games and i had zero desire to do that i just you know like that sounded it still sounds horrible to me um and it's it's hard because high school games are happening so fast and you can't see anything and you're like was that a four yard gain or like a three yard gain and it's just it's so difficult um but i did things like that um you know yes i got coffees and things like that um i said yes to anything and everything i could which again i I recognize not everybody's in a position to do but um doing so not only helped me meet people and things like that but it taught me you know kind of the balance of corporate america and and, you know the way life goes and whatnot and everything is a learning opportunity and i i would say that and i would i would say just be adventurous i mean and 
you don't have to try one thing and be stuck there forever. Pivot, you know, adjust, move around. If you don't like what you're doing, you don't like your TikTok, start an Instagram or start a YouTube channel, start a podcast, whatever. Um, and I would also say uh, create a professional email address like right away because you don't want your like Prince of Darkness, you know, 420 email when you're you know trying to email important people or whatever. So create a professional email address and just use it for professional things. Oh, that sounds great. Great advice right there. Very important. Definitely agree. Uh, I would love at some point to be in a position that you're at. So, again, I appreciate you hopping on of the mindset, trying to network, build, resume, things of that nature, build a portfolio. So, again, appreciate you hopping on. Fourth quarter segment, we love food on the show. I'm a foodie. I love to eat. I saw the other day, it was last week or something like that, you had the Cowboys game the next day and you was smoking some meat. What's your favorite meal to cook? Yeah, so I um, I mentioned I'm 34 years old. I have a two-year-old son. So I'm at the point where I either had to like get into World War II or start smoking meat. And um, and so I, I went with smoking meat. Uh, so I got a pit boss uh, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, just gotten a little bit more into it. And, you know, I, I live in Texas and I'm a Cowboys fan and love football. So it all just kind of, you know, works with that vibe. Um, I, I finally, you know, perfected – perfected is a strong word, but I really enjoyed a, a rack of ribs that I smoked on there this past weekend. So that was great. Um, but favorite is definitely pulled pork. I just I, – it's so Ooh. it's so easy. You just slap it in there. Um, it is kind of a special occasion thing for me. Like I save it for, like, the Masters. I'll probably do it, like, week one, you know, that first game, that Thursday – um and i don't like to eat it in sandwiches i like to eat it in tacos um so just you know get a flour tortilla some onions the right barbecue sauce and just you know my my wife will eat it one time and my parents will eat a little bit but i have enough to eat like eight meals off of and then just feel terrible for a week uh so uh pulled pork is definitely my answer no nah, that definitely sounds good right there that sounds i love having all types of tacos so pulled pork taco i'm sure it really is good like you said the barbecue sauce is huge in that mm-hmm. for you capital facts I, I saw you, you houston astros fan houston astros they won the world series two years ago do you see them repeat in this year it's funny you bring that up right now they just won i've got the game on behind you uh here in my office and uh sorry about that but um i mean it's so strange being a fan of, of them and the cowboys in that um, I don't know how well you follow baseball or how well your audience does, but they, they it is never enough for the Astros. And, and that's what makes being a fan of them is so awesome. Um, you know, like before the season started, it's like, well, Ryan Presley's like one of the greatest closers in, in the world. It's like, okay, well, we want Josh Hader. Like, you know, it's just like we it is never, ever enough. And that is as, as a fan of the team, it is just so cool to see them that hungry. And it is so cool that they never die no matter what like no no matter what you can think that they're dead and they will not go away i mean they just won uh right now it's their longest road game winning streak i think since 2015 they, they this was a nine game road uh series or not series road you know trip and they lost the first game in arlington actually against the rangers and then they won the last eight games i mean it's just amazing there's no kyle tucker there's no justin verlander there's no Luis Garcia. there's no lance mccullers jr there's no jose arquiti i mean they find a way no matter what and i would say the heartbeat of all that is probably Jose Altuve. Jordan Alvarez deserves a lot of credit, obviously, as well. Um, Alex Bregman chips in. Like, it is a total team effort. And again, that's, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't know if you like the Astros a lot. Of, obviously, that's a, a touch, touchy subject for some people. But what I loved about that, that World Series run in 2022 was throughout that playoffs, everybody had a moment. Like, everybody had something. Um, you know, like, I, I just, you know, Trey Mancini was this trade they made at the deadline, and he was so bad in, in the World Series. He was awful. Like, he was terrible. He couldn't buy a hit. And in Game 5 against the Phillies in the World Series, he had to jump in for Yuli, uh, <laughs> Yuli Gruyel, and he played first base, and he just had this incredible stop of a – like, this line drive of a grounder for an out. That was – but, again, like, I remember that moment that was Trey Mancini's. It was, they're just – they're a great team. Um, and I, you can't count them out. It sounds impossible. It sounds stupid. Like, why wouldn't you take the Dodgers or, uh, you know, maybe you're into the Phillies or whoever right now, whoever's hot. But they they are they are Freddy Krueger. They will never die. No, that's a perfect way to explain them. But a couple of my friends are Yankees fans, and oh, they, they – Yeah. It, it is so cool. That's like 
I always wonder what it's like to be like a Niners fan or, or a Packers fan and like own the Cowboys. But like I kind of get it. You know what I mean? As an Astros fan, like you know, there's always like I obviously know a lot of Yankees fans, and they're like, "Are you scared?" I'm like, "No, I'm not scared. Like I would love to <laughs> to see the Yankees in any series. Like this is like the Astros are their daddy in every way, shape, and form." We bring it up every time because he every year we talk about MLB for the season stars, and it's the yeah, it's gonna be our year. Yankees gonna win, and every time we bring up. So the Astros, though. Yeah. That's all I... Let's see what y'all do against the Astros. Y'all could win 120 games. Let's see if you guys meet up with the Astros, what happens, and then we'll find out if it's actually y'all year or not. And I will say, like, another thing on the Astros, um, it was very awkward for me during the ALCS when they played the Rangers because I obviously have a lot of DFW followers. They, they, they root for all the teams. Um and so, and it was very painful when when Astros lost, obviously, and the way it happened, you know, and the fact that the Rangers won the World Series was just like a bummer on top of it all. And I thought when that happened, I thought like, man, I will never get over this. Um, like this was just so devastating the way it happened. But then they're right back in it. Like I, like, I don't even care anymore. It's like, oh, we'll just go in another one. Like it, it must be like what the Chiefs felt like when they lost the Super Bowl to the Buccaneers. It's like when you're this good and you're like, you can't practically expect to like win it all and win everything every single year all the time forever and ever and ever. But like if you're in the mix every single time, it, it those things hurt less because you're always, you know, at the rim and you always have a chance. And so that's who the Astros are. Literally, that's. Like you say, you can't count them out. Is they're going to be in that conversation? They're going to be in the mix every year. I don't. And it's a, such a long season. Who's your, I don't who's care your, how your MLB are. team then. I'm actually Dodgers. Okay, well, I'm pretty much. Know. Then that that was really bold. You know, really sincere of you to give the Astros some props. Not not every Dodgers fan's willing to do that. So kudos. I can I can be objective in that regard. <laughs> That's right. right on. <laughs> this or that movies or TV shows. TV shows, I think. Um, I actually was telling a friend today, I haven't been to the movie theater since uh, Avengers Endgame came out. Um, and some of that was, like, my wife and I weren't going a lot anyway. Uh, and then COVID, and then, you know, things just became more accessible at home. And then we had a, a kid, and you know what I mean? Like, it, it all just kind of snowballed. Like, I'm sure that when he's at a point that he wants to go to movies, like, we'll, we'll go back. But um, I just have no desire to go. And even then, it, it's so, like... It's so hard to find two hours to sit and devote to a movie. Like it's like you can give me, I can give an hour to a TV show, and that's great. And then maybe I can do two episodes or something like that. So definitely TV shows. Yeah, same same thing. We got kids. Yeah, when if they want to go, maybe maybe we'll go back then. And if then, let's first see if it's streaming at home first exactly. before before we even go that route. Flats or drums. Um, I used to be a drums person. Like I used to, that would be my answer. And I think everyone goes that way because, um, it's more meat, but I definitely think I'm more flats now. Like I think flats is a, is a larger skill set. Um, you just kind of poke out the middle part of things, obviously my biggest thing. And I have made this joke a million times, so I'm sorry. I, um, I'm a ranch person. I don't know if you're a weirdo that goes blue cheese, but, um, what, I, what bothers me is the round you know containers for the ranch because whether it's a drum or a flat you can't get in there we need a square or a rectangular thing you know like like you know the things that you put coins in the cabin to sit in you know what i'm talking about yeah. we need something like that so what we can just rotate you know the the wing in that would be my dream for a flat that's too crazy because i had it in my notes that i was going to ask you about the rectangular because i saw that <laughs> and i saw you talk about it i wanted you to mention it and it just happened to come up perfectly so that's mad funny you brought it up because it's literally in my notes right here rectangular cup for sauce yeah i uh, i make that joke a lot because that's that's i said i have a two-year-old son i want him to live in that world someday where we have rectangular you know saucer cups so x or threads i know that people feel different ways i will never T twitter is a big reason that my career has been what it is and it would be difficult for me to say like it's stupid and it's meaningless like yeah it has problems i'm not you know gonna say it doesn't but um it's still in spite of all the like junk or whatever you want to call it it's still the go-to place threads is cool and and it has its 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 place and i i'm active on there because i i believe in that but uh but definitely i i struggle to call it x uh, but but definitely that platform I just threw it out there. I didn't know if you called it X. I know, I know everybody. I know we still call it Twitter, right. but I didn't. I didn't know how you viewed it. Last one: TikTok or Instagram? This is 
a, a challenging one for me because it's difficult to grow there. I've had you know success on Twitter um, and not as much on Instagram. I think I lean Instagram. Um, the community that I've I've been able to connect with yourself included is, is a little bit more interesting to me. But TikTok is is just a magic little bird. I mean, it's you know when you get when you get down the right kind of rabbit hole, it is a very special place. Um, so situationally, maybe TikTok, but maybe you know eight out of ten times Instagram. I feel you on that one. Last question before we end this episode. Being that you have an extensive knowledge of the Cowboys, you have been covering them for a very long time, you are a fan of them, who would you have as your Mount Rushmore of Cowboys players? You know, I've said forever that my favorite athlete of my, of my lifetime, like people I watched, you know, when I was a conscious person, um, was... Um, and the Cowboys just made a trade right now. Interestingly, they just traded for Jordan Phillips, the defensive lineman. So um, that's good to know. Um, so as, let me just enter this Slack message. Uh, so um, I would my favorite athlete my entire life was Tony Romo, just because he was the quarterback of my favorite team when I was in high school, when I was in college, like at a very impressionable age. Like so many important moments in my life happened with that common denominator. Um, so I would put Tony Romo there. I'd put Dak Prescott there now just because of uh, partly of, of the human being he is. Um, but I mean, he has just been, you know, this incredible kind of flashpoint for who they've been in the time since I would put Emmett Smith up there. He's the NFL's all time leading rusher. And he means a lot to my dad and, you know, a, a generation of Cowboys fans that came before. And then I think you have to put Roger Staubach because he means a lot to America. Like he's just the greatest human being of all time. So, um, I would probably answer that differently a year from now, a week from now. That's just kind of the way it goes when there's so many great players that have played for the team, but that's how I feel right now. I don't think anybody could disagree with that list. I mean, like you said, it, it's such a storied franchise. You could really choose anybody, honestly, and mm-hmm. put that on the list. Like You could even go, if you want to do obscure, you could say Larry Allen, one of the best right. offensive linemen ever in history. Like, so it's a lot of great players that have come through the Cowboys organization. RJ Ochoa, we thank you for hopping on with us. We thank you for taking time out your busy schedule to hop on the Bench Mob ENT. For those that have watched it up to this point, if you haven't already, because he gave out great information, hit that subscribe button, share, tell any and everybody, tell your baby moms, your uncle, your cousin. If y'all don't talk, this might bring y'all back together. Exactly. You know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. Benchmark, we out. Peace.